and most recently, 1493, uh, for which he was here in this same room a few months ago at a John Adams event, which is a book uh, about, you might say, the world after Columbus with a focus on uh, the natural world and how it, uh, we have changed it. Uh, he uh, lives in Massachusetts, but it just happened through an email exchange uh, uh, discovering that, in fact, he was going to be here in Amsterdam at, at, at the same time that Colin Murphy was, and so we thought uh, this is uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful serendipity. So uh, please welcome our moderator, Charles Mann. Thank you very much for coming in this very cold night and uh, you have a real treat in store for you. I've known Cullen for a really long time. We actually uh, went to the same college, briefly crossed paths there, and um, since then I've known him as uh, one of my editors. And uh, if you're a writer, one of the things that you say to yourself constantly to, in a you know, sort of feeble effort to bolster your spirits is that, well, if your editors could really write, they would be writers too, and therefore you're in some way superior to them. Um, unfortunately, this consolation has been denied to me because Cullen has been my editor, and um, he's an extremely good writer, uh, much to my frustration. Um, I wish I could say something else. It would make me feel better, but I'm, I am forced by many years of evidence to, to admit that Cullen is really, really good. But one thing that I did kind of reassure myself with is that for many years, when I would asked Cullen what he was doing, he would sort of say glumly, I'm working on my book about the Inquisition. And um, I was really happy because it was taking him a long time, and therefore he was probably having difficulty. And then secretly I kind of thought, what is he doing writing? A, why is he writing about the Inquisition? You know, what on earth is he doing with this? Um, finally the book came out, and uh, my hopes were shattered. I saw immediately why he'd been writing it, and that it was really good. Um, and uh, it's gotten enormous acclaim in the United States and um, in England and you're really in for a treat to hear about it. And it turns out that the Inquisition, this you know, sort of arcane subject, alas, has everything to do with uh, contemporary America and contemporary American society, and Cullen will talk something about that. He's gonna talk for about a half an hour. I'll um, attempt to provoke him into, for the next half hour or so, um, into saying unwise statements um, in our conversation, and then we'll open it up, and you can take a crack at him yourself. Thank you, please welcome Cullen Murphy. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Russell, and thank you very much, uh, Charles. There were so many things you could have said and didn't. You know, when, when you know someone for 35 years, it's a real act of faith to uh, let them come in front of you. Um, thank you so, so much for inviting me here um, this evening. I've been looking forward to it um, <clears throat> for such a long time. Uh, and... I should start out by saying, I think, um, just so that you know where I am coming from, that, uh, that I, I, I write this book as a person who is a Catholic, but who also works for Vanity Fair magazine. And so I'm clearly the kind of Catholic who wouldn't have lasted long in the 14th century. Um, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be talking tonight about, about the Inquisition, which I think, as we all know, was a long-term effort by the Catholic Church to deal with, it, deal with what it perceived to be its enemies, both inside and out, and really by any means uh, necessary. You know, it started in the Middle Ages, and, and the very word inquisition makes us think medieval. Um, but my argument is, in fact, that we shouldn't think of it that way, that we should think of it as, in some ways, a modern institution, maybe even a living one. And, and one whose methods are not really about religion per se. So for about the next half hour, I'm going to lead you through just a, a short summary of, of the argument I'm trying to make in the book, and interspersed with that will be a little bit about the Inquisition just as history, because in my, in my experience, people don't necessarily know certain basic facts about the Inquisition. Um, the coat of arms right here is the symbol of one of the inquisitions, and there were more than one. But this is the one 
that uh, everyone seems to know about, which is the Spanish Inquisition. And that's also, since uh, Russell mentioned it, that's also, of course, this Inquisition. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. <clears throat> the Spanish Inquisition began in the late 1400s under Ferdinand and Isabella. But I'd like to turn the clock back even further to a man named Bernard Guy. He was a papal inquisitor in France, and he was active during the very first Inquisition. Here is a picture of him, I mean, not really of him, but <coughs> him as uh, F. Murray Abraham played him in the movie of The Name of the Rose. But Bernard Guy was a real person, and he left behind a manuscript that he called The Book of Sentences. It was a record of his entire career, the people he interrogated, the judgments he rendered, the sermons he pronounced at the sentencing. The manuscript is preserved today at the British Library in London, and it's a haunting document. I've, I've taken it out. I've looked through it uh, several times, and I'm going to come back to that manuscript at the end of this talk <clears throat> because there's something I want to say about how it came to the British Library, which I think is actually important, and it involves... Um, this city. For, for getting a feel of the Inquisition in practice, there's nothing quite like Bernard Guy's Book of Sentences. You get a sense of inquisitors moving from town to town, questioning witnesses, applying torture in some cases, and making a documentary record that itself becomes a tool for others to use. His book is laid out in such a way that it becomes almost a search engine on parchment. And this gets to the heart of what I mean when I say that we need to think of the Inquisition not so much as something medieval, but as something modern. The Inquisition was fed by religious hatred, religious intolerance, yes, of course. But it also needed something else in order to remain in place for generation after generation. It needed modern tools. It needed to have a bureaucracy. It needed record keeping. It needed to be able to find information after it was written down. It needed trained personnel, what today we might call technocrats. It needed instruction manuals. It needed a science of interrogation. It needed mechanisms of censorship. It needed techniques of surveillance. A thousand years ago, these tools did not really exist in the way we understand them now. In the late Middle Ages, we start to see them develop. They make the Inquisition possible. And today, we accept all of these tools as a fact of life. On every one of these fronts, we are far, far advanced. These tools have been sh thrown into sharp relief by the events of the past decade after 9-11. So when we look today at the Inquisition, we are not really looking at a throwback. We are looking, I would argue, at a harbinger. So <clears throat> let's rewind brief briefly for a bit of history. We're all familiar with scenes like this one that depict a great auto da fe, or act of faith. These were the ceremonial moments when the people convicted by the Inquisition would be paraded in public wearing penitential garb. If the, if the people convicted happened to be dead already, they would be dug up and paraded by in carts. The, 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 um, uh, the people condemned to die would be let outside and they would be burned at the stake. If a particular mercy was going to be shown to them, a bag of gunpowder might be hung around their neck so that the end came um, faster. But these big scenic auto da fe's took centuries to develop. The first inquisitions were much more modest. I mentioned a few moments ago that there were many inquisitions. They start in the 13th century, when the pope deputizes a special group of clerics, mainly Dominican priests, to go into southern France and other areas that had become breeding grounds of heresy, particularly of the heretics known as Cathars, of whom probably most of you have heard. This is the so-called medieval inquisition. <clears throat> the inquisitors would go into a locale, announce their arrival, begin putting people under interrogation, and hand down judgments. 
Historians don't have firm numbers, but overall, maybe 2% of those who came before an Inquisition tri tribunal were burned at the stake, tens of thousands of people. Some heretics took up arms. Hundreds were eventually trapped in this place, Montsegur, in the foothills of the Pyrenees. After a long siege, the Cathars eventually gave up, and 200 of them were burned at the stake at the base of this mountain. The inquisitors documented everything. Here's a, here's a very typical transcription of an expense account, right down to the cost of the rope. So the work of the medieval inquisition lasted for about a century. It was very decentralized and also very successful. As one historian writes, it came to an end because of a shortage of combustible material. And by the time it ended, there were no longer any Cathars. Although last week, after giving a talk, an old man came up to me. He was bent over, and he sort of clutched at the rostrum, and he said, I am a Cathar. <laughs> so there was one, one got away. <clears throat> Uh, a second stage in the story of the Inquisition beginning in 1480 is the Spanish Inquisition, which was followed closely by the Portuguese. The Spanish Inquisition was directed at the outset by this man, Thomas de Torquemada, uh, another person of whom uh, we've, we've all heard, a zealous Dominican who wore hair shirts and traveled everywhere with armed guards for good reason. Although the Pope gave his permission to launch the Spanish Inquisition, it was always under the direct control of the Spanish crown. Church and state were indistinguishable. The main targets of the Spanish Inquisition were Jews, though Muslims were targeted as well. Anti-Semitic fervor had been a fact of life in Spain for more than a century, leading to forced conversions and the confinement of Jews to ghettos. The pretext for the Inquisition was that some of those converted Jews were Judaizing, that is, returning to Judaism. In the first decade and a half of the Spanish Inquisition, some 2,000 people were burned at the stake. In this room, Ferdinand and Isabella affixed their signatures to a document that spelled catastrophe, catastrophe for tens of thousands of, of Spanish Jews. The year was 1492. Ferdinand and Isabella had just kicked out the last Muslim sultan and taken over the Alhambra. A few weeks after that, they gave Columbus their blessing. And a few weeks after that, they signed the Edict of Expulsion, ordering all converted Jews out of Spain. And many of them eventually, as, as you know, came to the city. The Spanish Inquisition, together with the Portuguese Inquisition, would survive into the early 19th century. Here's a rendition by Goya, uh, of an Inquisition tribunal from that period, from the early 1800s. Goya had a very personal stake in the matter. He had himself become an Inquisition target for his painting of a nude woman whom he refused to identify, uh, and he never did. Art historians still aren't sure who she is. Um, but his interrogation was harsh, and he left behind, in return, dozens of depictions of the Inquisition. So here's a key fact about the Inquisitions in Iberia. They went global. Spain and Portugal, Portugal became empires, and the Inquisition followed the flag. This is the coat of arms of the Portuguese Inquisition from the city of Goa in India. The Spanish or Portuguese Inquisition spread to the Philippines, Macau, Angola, Mozambique, Brazil, Peru, Mexico. There was Inquisition activity in what is now New Mexico in the United States. Eight men were beheaded in the plaza. The last official act of the Inquisition in California was to attempt to prohibit, to, to prohibit a particular dance, the waltz. California has gotten way beyond the Inquisition, as, <laughs> as we know. A third stage of the Inquisition is what's called the Roman Inquisition, which was launched in 1542, mainly to combat Protestantism, though it also had its eye on Jews, scientists, free thinkers. The Roman Inquisition was very centralized and run directly from the Vatican. Its headquarters is that trapezoidal building 
underneath, with the red dot, underneath the southern wing of Bernini's colonnade. Uh, it dates to the mid-16th century. The, the work on building the Palazzo of the Inquisition was deemed so important that the Pope stopped the work on St. Peter's right next door <clears throat> and diverted all the stonecutters to build the Inquisition's Palazzo. So this is what the building looked like originally. It held prison cells until the 1920s, when it was finally remodeled. Today, it's the headquarters of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is still the church's theological watchdog. I've never been able to understand why they would not have moved that office out of that building, uh, if only for public relations purposes. But, um, <clears throat> but PR has never, never been the, uh, the Holy See's forte. <laughs> Uh, the Roman Inquisition is the one that burned the cosmologist Giordano Bruno at the stake. It's the one that created the Index of Forbidden Books. And it's the one that put Galileo on trial. Galileo, of course, had the last laugh in more ways than one. There's a small part of Galileo that is not buried in the beautiful marble tomb in Santa Croce. And that small part of Galileo is actually on display at the nearby Museo Galileo, and it's his middle finger. <laughs> <clears throat> the archives of the Roman Inquisition, about 400 years worth, are preserved at the Palazzo, that same Palazzo at the Vatican. And most of them were open to scholars about a decade ago. Uh, perhaps the only act of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger with which I am in wholehearted dis uh, agreement. Uh, one section holds maps of all the ghettos that Jews were confined to in Italian cities. Here's a map. This is from the archives, the Inquisition archives, of the Rome ghetto. That's the area shaded in yellow. Uh, and it's still, to this day, the site of Rome's great synagogue. The Roman Inquisition uh, came, effectively came to an end in 1870 when the Papal States were absorbed into a unified Italy. Pope Pius IX, the man who proclaimed papal infallibility, took refuge in the Vatican. There seems to be a kind of rule in art history that the most glorious depictions of powerful people are created just before their downfall. And here is Pius IX, not long before the walls of Rome were breached, and Italian troops poured in. Uh, the Roman Inquisition was not formally abolished until 1908. And even then, as Vatican observers today will tell you, what has really changed is just the name. In the course of three decades or so of, of writing about religion and covering religion, I've met many theologians, including in this country, who have had, who've run into trouble with Rome and been called to the Vatican to answer questions and be subject, subjected to procedures that are not un, you know, not uninquisition like um, the congregation doesn't burn authors or books, um, but they can put you through a kind of hell. So now let's come back to the argument about why we should think of the Inquisition as modern. It's one thing to have an outbreak of bloody repression motivated by fear and hatred. That's been happening for thousands of years. It's quite another to impose repression over a period of decades or centuries. There's a reason why the Inquisition arises when it does and doesn't arise much earlier. It arises when it does because only then is the Western world beginning to develop certain powerful organizing tools. So let's go back to Bernard Guy. Here's one of the opening pages from his book of sentences. Guy has, Guy has done something relatively new here. He has listed every person he interrogated by town, and then after each name, he notes where in this book or in some other volume you can get more information about that particular individual. Guy was not alone in creating indexes. For inquisitors, creating easily searchable documents was routine. If someone had come before a tribunal in, say, uh, Toulouse in 1300, and then that same person showed up in Carcassonne 30 years later, the inquisitors in Carcassonne would know very quickly 
that he'd been in to lose three decades earlier. This ability to search documents seems pretty basic to us. It was a revolution at the time. The inability to find information in archives has been a huge liability. I mean, we know what the inability to find information in our homes is like. Um, there's a famous moment when King Edward I of, of England knew that somewhere in his archives he had a document that showed that he was the Lord of Scotland. And on two occasions he sent his secretaries to go find that document, which would have saved him a world of trouble, and they never could. So the ability to search is one important new tool. A second is information gathering itself, amassing a storehouse of data. Repressive regimes are record-keeping regimes. Just visit the archives in Moscow or Berlin. During the Inquisition, information gathering was sometimes done by surveillance. The Spanish Inquisition had a group of agents known as familiars uh, who kept watch on neighborhoods. And at one point in Valencia, there was one familiar for every 42 households, which is a pretty intensive level of penetration. Sometimes the inquisitors cast their, wet, their net very widely. There's a little town in the south of France called Montaillou, which in the early 14th century was a hotbed of Catharism. And the local bishop, a man named Jacques Fournier, decided to take the entire town into custody, 200 people, and detain them for two years and question them painstakingly. Fournier was interested in absolutely everything, what people ate, what they drank, local customs, superstitions, who was sleeping with who, especially who was sleeping with who. And um, Fournier vacuumed up this information uh, indiscriminately, deciding how to use it later. He wrote everything down. That's from his famous book. And because he went on to become Pope Benedict XII, it all survived. So speaking of vacuuming up information indiscriminately, we have, of course, made huge advances uh, in this endeavor. Uh, today, we are far from coming to terms with the information revolution that got its start in the Middle Ages and that has been propelled by new forms of national security. In Britain today, ordinary life is monitored by a network of more than four million video cameras. Around the world, electronic surveillance and record keeping automatically monitor billions of people. Databases can be linked and cross-referenced in a way that Bernard Guy could only envy. A third tool adopted by the Inquisition goes by the name training. If you want an institution to last for a really long time, you have to train a group of professionals to carry on the work. You have to create what today we would call a bureaucracy. The Middle Ages was very big on training manuals. There are manuals for hearing confessions. There are manuals for becoming a Dominican priest. There are manuals teaching princes on how, how to become kings. Um, and here is one of the most influential man manuals ever written. It's the Directorium Inquisitorum by a man named Nicholas Americk. This is a how-to book for inquisitors. Among other things, it offers practical advice on how to ask questions of people called up on charges. Uh, very meticulous questions, sample responses, questions to ask when the sample responses are inadequate, tricks. It's the direct ancestor of this book the U.S. Army uh, Field Manual. Uh, and I use the word direct advisedly. If you, if you take a look at, at Americ's directorium and the Army field, field Manual, if you put them side by side, the resemblances are just absolutely un, uncanny. You know, for instance, um, faced with a, an uncooperative witness and you want to trick the witness into thinking you know more than you do, you get a big stack of documents. This is Nicholas Americ advises, put them on your desk, and as the person you're questioning is talking, you should flip through the documents as if you know all of this already, and occasionally shake your head, and that it will have a, a very disturbing effect on the person you're talking to. And the U.S. Army Field Manual has the exact same technique, which they call the file and dossier approach. But um, technique after technique after technique, they're completely parallel.
Interrogation leads inevitably to a fourth modern tool, which leads to this place, Guantanamo. In one sense, torture isn't new at all. It's as old as humanity. But in the Middle Ages, it starts to become systematic, part of the legal system, something that can be justified philosophically and theologically. There's a long history here, and the story it tells is the development of a very modern sensibility. But we never see it that way. Perhaps we don't want to. A thousand years ago, the form of justice widely used in Europe was trial by ordeal, in which God himself was called upon to decide matters of guilt and innocence. What better proof could there be than God himself? So it was all very primitive, but also very certain. Then came the medieval revolution in jurisprudence and the idea that issues of guilt and innocence could be placed in human hands, an obvious step forward. Uh, but without God, what was the standard of proof? Well, people thought, uh, a confession would be good. That would be uh, something we could believe. But sometimes people don't confess. What do we do then? Well, perhaps some form of encouragement could be applied. And suddenly, this reform has the effect of opening the door to torture. In 1252, the pope issued a bull called Ad Abolendum, which allowed inquisitors to use torture in their work. Ad Abolendum is the medieval equivalent of the so-called Bybee memos. These were the memos produced by the American Justice Department which laid out the grounds for torture that the Bush administration attempted to rely on. This is Camp X-Ray. It's got its name because you can see through the cages. And it's where the first detainees were held in 2002, the year when the US government was formulating its torture policies. We know now what the medieval inquisitors understood and the American interrogators soon discovered for themselves. It's very hard to keep torture under control. Each small extra turn of the screw offers the promise of some small extra piece of information. And there are always ways to justify it. The medieval inquisitors were technically limited to one session of torture per person. But they got around it by arguing that the second session and the third session and the fourth se session were merely continuances of the first session. Here's a memo signed off on by Donald Rumsfeld, the former US Defense Secretary, setting out the interrogation techniques al allowed at Guantanamo. And already, he's taking issue with the constraints. I stand for eight to 10 hours a day, he writes there on the bottom. Why is standing limited to four hours? The Guantanamo interrogators have described how they were pressured to adopt more and more severe methods even using techniques they'd seen on the television program 24. The Inquisition used three main forms of torture. One is the rack, the only one of the three that the US seems not to have used on detainees in the War on Terror. The second was suspension, known as the strapado to the Inquisition. One Guantanamo detainee is known to have died as a result of this method from asphyxiation. And the third technique was waterboarding, known as the toca, for the cloth that covers the face on which water is poured. This has been widely used in modern times. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded 183 times. Though defenders of the practice take issue with that number, they say 183 was simply the number of, of pores but that there were, in fact, only five sessions. Uh, that word continuance comes to mind. The fifth and last modern tool that I'll mention here is censorship. Burning books is nothing new. There are reference, references to book burning in the Bible. But making the control or destruction of information part of an organized and ongoing effort was a task pioneered by the Inquisition. From the church's point of view, it was made necessary by the printing press and the great freedom it unleashed. At the Inquisition archives in Rome one day, I came across this. 
Uh, and it's a curious looking display. And of course, you could hardly be, you know, as you can see there, it says uh, A to K, L to Z. And you know, it's like a sign saying wet paint. You have to go and open it up. The, the hinges, the, the tops have hinges. And um, so I did go over and, and, and lift up the top, and inside there are these rows and rows of cards. And you pull out the cards, and you begin to see, like, Spinoza, you know, Sartre. And so I said to the director of the archives who was with me, I said, what's this? And he said, oh, that is the index of forbidden books. And to me, seeing some, you know, the index of forbidden books always loomed very large in my Catholic boyhood. Um, you know, people were always pointing out that such and such was on the index of forbidden books. It made you just want to go out and buy it immediately. And um, to think that something as iconic as the index of forbidden books was actually in this quite beautiful piece of furniture um, astonished me at that moment and still, still does. The index was not abolished until 1966. It was started in 1559. Um, but over the centuries, some of its work was very effective. Agents of the Vatican scoured publishers and libraries. They kept watch at ports. They took books already published and crossed out offending passages. For instance, trying to find every use of the word for sexual intercourse, coitus, and replacing it with the more demure copula. You actually find books blotted out with the new word written in. If only the Inquisition had the tools we have now. We've all heard of China's great firewall. Here's just one small part of a list of terms. And it's a very long list that you'll be blocked from searching on the web in China. In the United States, we still have book burnings and attempts to pull books from libraries. But the real action here and elsewhere is on the internet. The internet gets applause for sparking the Arab Spring, sure. But let's not forget that Egypt was able to shut down the entire internet in that country, or that Iran monitors Twitter and Facebook to gather up names of dissidents. New software enables specific content to be pulled off distant computers at the stroke of a keyboard. Parts of the US government will soon adopt software that will delete information if a laptop goes outside of certain GPS coordinates. Not long ago, Amazon made news when it realized that it had made available the wrong electronic editions of two books and pulled them remotely from everyone's Kindle. Unfortunately for Amazon, the books were Animal Farm in 1984. <laughs> so let me now come back to Bernard Gee and his book of sentences. We have better tools for an inquisition if somebody wants one than ever before. Personally, I'm not confident that there is a way, uh, that, that there is a way uh, by means of law or engineering exclusively of controlling any of these tools. Bureaucracies take on lives of their own. Look at what has happened to the American intelligence apparatus, which now comprises scores of agencies and nearly 2,000 private corporations. Surveillance and censorship technology, you can buy this stuff off the shelf. But there remains the matter of moral certainty, the desire to impose your beliefs on others, to lay down rules about what kind of ideas or what kinds of people are acceptable, which of course is the impulse behind any inquisition, religious or secular. When you hear about fatwas and great firewalls, or you listen to debates about whether the United States is or should be a Christian nation, or you listen to debates about whether the demands of national security should trump every other value and concern, you can ask yourself whether moral certainty is really a thing of the past. When I was looking through Bernard Gee's manuscript at the British Library, I noticed several pages glued into the front. It was a series of letters from the 17th century describing how the book had come into the possession of the British Library to begin with. The manuscript had been discovered in Montpellier by a traveling Englishman 
who arranged to have it lent to the great Dutch historian of the Inquisition, Philip von Limburg. Philip von Limburg used the manuscript in his book. In fact, he printed the entire thing as an appendix. And his book was one of the first true histories, history in the sense that we would uh, understand it, of the Inquisition. And then the Englishman and Philip van Limborg uh, found a buyer who paid off the archive, the archive in Montpellier. And as a result, the manuscript was sent to England, where it has been ever since. The traveling Englishman was this man, the philosopher John Locke. He was in the midst of writing his famous essay on tolerance, in which he argued that attempting to impose belief was not only wrong in principle, who among us knows the ultimate truth, but also wrong as a practical matter. People won't agree with you even if you do, and the result is going to be strife and bloodshed. Locke represented a new intellectual tradition, and it was this tradition, slowly gathering acceptance, that really brought the old Inquisition to an end. We sometimes think that ideas don't have much power. We can't see them. They are easy to ignore. But they are among the most powerful forces of all. Ideas that seemed preposterous only a few generations ago, that all people are equal, that people have the right to self-government, are now entrenched. So the thought that I would leave you with this evening when it comes to inquisitions is simply the necessity of tolerance, the urgency of tolerance. An embattled ideal, even in liberal democracies like ours, an invisible and fragile thing, but the best defense that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was terrific. So you began this book, though, before 9-11, right? Yes. You began it in, 19, in the late 1990s, I think you were thinking of it. So how did you get involved, seeing as how all the things that you were talking about at the end hadn't happened yet? How did this, uh, how did this book come to mind? It was, uh, it was a very organic process, and it goes, to, um, it goes to something that I referred to a few moments ago, uh, in my career as, as someone who has written about religion. Uh, so in the course of, of writing a number of, um, of long pieces for the Atlantic Monthly mm -hmm. and other uh, publications um, about religion, I, I came to know a great many theologians. Um, I was speaking earlier this evening about um, uh, Edward Skillebex mm -hmm. here in, here in, in the Netherlands. Um, but many others, and, uh, and all too many of them had had experiences where, because of something that they had written, uh, uh, they were either uh, stripped of their title, their right to teach as a Catholic theologian, or they were removed from a job, or they were silenced in some mm -hmm. fashion, or an official censor was appointed to, in effect, be their shadow, and... Uh, you know, th these, these are more frequent than you would think. Mm -hmm. And so as, as these episodes began to accumulate in my own mind, it did make me think about the question, well, did the Inquisition ever really end? Mm -hmm. And on these 100 acres on the, across the Tiber, maybe, <coughs> maybe not. And one of these theologians then told me that, you know, the... Um, Cardinal Ratzinger's department, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the, of the Faith, you know, did you know that his office is in the same office as the, as the Inquisition's, which I hadn't. And that's, that, was a, you know, that was the sort of fact that makes you sit up. And <laughs> um, so those two things really in, in combination were what got me started. Um, and then there was a third thing, which was, which was just luck. But it turns out that that right now is kind of a golden age of Inquisition scholarship for a variety of reasons, but one of them is simply that archives have become available. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, archives in Italy and Spain, France, um, <coughs> but even the Vatican, in, which in 1998 opened, opened the Inquisition archives. Uh, again, I alluded mm -hmm. to that. And they've done a terrific job in allowing people in. Oh yes, they stop in 1939 with Pope Pius XII, who is still too hot to handle. Um, but everything from you know, 1542 onwards, it, it, up to 1939, is available to scholars. And you know, it's, it's fascinating documentation. So there's two things that bring to mind. So meanwhile, as you're working on this book slowly, all this stuff is happening. And did it occur to you right away that uh, you're seeing a kind of renaissance in the U U.S. Or in practical inquisition studies? Not, not right away, mm -hmm. because it, um, the, the, all the stuff that you're referring to is the aftermath of 9-11, mm -hmm. new security procedures, enhanced surveillance, um, the, the return of, of torture, um, the ratcheting up of mm -hmm. information gathering, and so on. Um, I don't think people were really aware for about a year that the um, that the measures that were being taken were as severe or as permanent mm -hmm. as they would turn out to be. So it did not occur to me right away. Um, but by that time, you know, by 2002, 2003. Uh, I certainly had learned enough about the Inquisition to, to have some appreciation for what had, for its institutional underpinnings, what gave it such staying power. And so I think it was, I think it probably would have occurred to anyone as mm -hmm. you began to see what was happening in the modern world to make a connection between, between the two. One of the things that's really striking to me about your book is you talk about the, the Inquisition as a bureaucracy and uh, you know, as a career path. You know, as a, as a place, it wasn't just, you know, hundreds of years of zealotry. It was a way for people to make a living. It was a, it was a fact of life in the way that bureaucracies are. And, uh, you know, is that something that you see happening with a national security state in our own country? Yeah, I, you know, when I think back to the Inquisition in the 16th century, you know, I can imagine some Italian mm -hmm. mother saying to another mother, oh, you know, Paolo just got a job at the Inquisition. And the <laughs> other one saying, oh, I'm so happy for you. Um, um, well, how did but, you get a job at the Inquisition if you were in the 16th century? Did you um, just did they have forms? Did you apply? What, what did you do? Well, you, you you had to you had to be a cleric, mm -hmm. of course. Um, but once you got one, it was it was a fairly well developed um, bureaucracy. And uh, once you were inside, it was like in some ways like being inside any bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. You know, the petty power politics. You see this. For instance, in the uh, the minutes of the index of mm -hmm. forbidden books, where you know there are very uh, minutely detailed uh, records of discussions taking place, and there are disagreements. You can just see factions mm -hmm. aligned. One cardinal, Robert Bellarmine, a you know, very well-known um, intellectual, actually found one of his own books nearly came on the index of for forbidden books while he was on the committee that was <laughs> supposedly deciding what should be on it. And, um, I mean, doesn't that sound like bureaucracies we know? <laughs> uh, th but the, let me, let me just turn back the clock a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't, you know, we don't always appreciate um, that bureaucracy is something that actually had to come into existence, that it wasn't, it wasn't kind of always with us. But just to give you a, uh, just a, one quick statistic. In the, in the year 1200, the, the papal secretaries wrote about 300 letters a year. So that's mm -hmm. what the papal apparatus was capable of producing. A century later, in 1300, they wrote 50,000 mm -hmm. letters a year. Mm -hmm. So something, there's been a quantum leap in terms of organization that has occurred in that century. And that is the century when the Inquisition is beginning yeah, it's getting off the gr off the ground. One thing about bureaucracy, though, is that when you're a functionary, you have some metric by which your bosses <coughs> judge that you've done a good job. So, if you're an inquisitor, what's the what's the metric of success? H how do you know that you've been a good inquisitor and you deserve a raise? Well, I can think of one, but it's not <laughs> a pretty one. Uh, 
this is probably the point um, where I should emphasize that you know, the Inquis I divided the Inquisitions roughly into three groups here. Mm -hmm. The Inquisitions vary widely, mm -hmm. depending on where you're talking about, what year you're talking about. So it is kind of, of all over the, mm -hmm. over the map. Sometimes the metric is very clear. Um, was, you know, were the Cathars, except for the one man who came and talked <laughs> to me, uh, were they wiped out of southern France? So had you done your job in, in expunging them? Y that's yeah, right. Right, right. And and there it's very clear, mm -hmm. you know, job well done. Right. Um, in something like um, in, in the Roman Inquisition, mm -hmm. well, the Spanish Inquisition had the, uh, the very same consequence mm -hmm. over time. Uh, the Roman Inquisition, it was, it was much harder. Um, you know, its main task was to combat Protestantism. Not much success there, <laughs> as far as I can tell. And look around us. Yes, yeah. and and um, and also to combat, um, you know, the proliferation of books, um, which I really hope they haven't had much success with. <laughs> and um, and they knew they were having only limited success with. Um, you know, I think by that time they understood mm -hmm. that, you know, the jig was up. But the index was still was as porous as it was, it was still very effective in some ways. Mm -hmm. it, it, it added an element of risk to the transaction. If you wanted to think certain things, if you wanted to say those things out loud, if you wanted to publish those things, um, it was not certain that you would not pay a penalty for doing that, which is very similar mm -hmm. to China today. So how, so for instance, you publish your book not now, but 200 years from now, and somebody thinks that maybe this Cullen Murphy really needs to be taught a lesson, how would your book get on that the list? I mean, somebody would report it, what would be the next, what would be the stages before they decided that you were bad, or your book was bad? Yeah. It would be, it would be denounced. Okay. By who? By someone. Mm -hmm. It could be anyone. I could do it, because I'm a writer and I don't really like but my editors. Oh, and I would, I would. I mean, uh, <laughs> but it could, yes, it could yeah. be anyone. It could be lay people. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a famous, there's a famous episode in, um, oh, the, around 2002 mm -hmm. and 2003, when um, Cardinal Ratzinger receives a denunciation of Harry Potter from mm -hmm. just an ordinary person, I believe, in Germany, and and he writes back to her, and he doesn't say he doesn't say you know you can't read Harry Potter, but he does say that he is concerned about what he calls the subtle seductions of Harry Potter. Which That's implies familiarity on his part. With well, it, it may. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's, it he's is kind of nice to think of him curling up with there with the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, th but then, of course, he will encounter... Who's the woman inquisitor? The grand, oh, yeah, the yeah, grand inquisitor. Umbridge. Umbridge. Dolores Umbridge, yeah. the yeah. grand inquisitor of Hogwarts. <laughs> Maybe that's what he had in mind. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so somebody denounces the book. It can either be that, mm -hmm. or it could be that the inquisitors are going around looking for offending material, mm -hmm. and they're doing that as well. They're going to the Frankfurt Book Fair, for instance, um, which is, you know, 500 years old. Um, they, are, they, are, they are looking at the... Um, the lists of books that are being published in, you know, Zurich and mm -hmm. Paris and, and elsewhere for, for possibly troublesome uh, titles. Mm -hmm. And they have some real blind spots. They, um, they're not very good at, at reading German, and, um, and they really don't care about anything in English. Um, because these are, from their point of view, these are not Romance languages, and mm -hmm. therefore they're they're beyond the membrane of civilization. Um, um, I've, I've thought that myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we don't have to worry about our books. Okay. But um, but anything in French or Italian or Latin was was very mm -hmm. very problematic. Or if your um, your book in English was translated into French or Italian, then you might have trouble, which is Uncle Tom's Cabin mm -hmm. had trouble only after it was translated into, I think, French. So there, was there, a, was there a, a jury that, um, that then read the book and said this is, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, and, and there, are, there, are, there are long, um, I mean, there, there are deep dossiers of documents mm -hmm. over many well-known books, and the, you know, the discussion over Uncle Tom's Cabin 
is actually a fairly detailed one. The problem with, un with Uncle Tom's Cabin was that its depiction of Quakers was very friendly, and, uh, and the church didn't like that. And so it was going to be put on the index because it was so friendly to Quakers. And, th and then someone pointed out, but wait, have you noticed that it's also anti-slavery? And so are we. <laughs> and then they weighed the two things and figured, oh, I guess the anti-slavery part is more important than the Quaker part, and they didn't put it on the index. Wow. Yeah. That was a close one. That's right. Yeah. Graham Greene is another person mm -hmm. uh, where the, the, um, the document, the, uh, the discussions, the minutes of the discussion survive. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating. It's, it's like... Um, it's like reading you know, the letters to the editor column in some scholarly journal, uh, well, some nutty scholarly <laughs> journal, um, uh, about the merits and demerits of Graham Greene's fiction. Hmm. And fi finally, a, um, a very well-read Monsignor steps in to call a halt to the, the entire charade, hmm. basically saying, uh, we are going to be a laughing stock if we go on record condemning Graham Greene. You know, this is the kind of person that thinking people, you know, thinking Catholics read. Um, why pull the rug out from underneath The them? world's most famous Catholic novelist. That, that's yeah, right. Yeah. So this is all, you're reading about this in the actual building. Yes. Yeah. Well, there, what was it like being in that building? I mean, just across the threshold of the Inquisition. Uh, you know, I, th I thought... The, the first time that I went there, um, I thought the experience was going to be somehow different than it turned out to be. You saw the building from the from the air. It's a it's a very typical Roman palazzo, and it has a, a big, heavy, studded wooden door. And you go through it, and there's a courtyard, and there's a fountain. Mm -hmm. So it could be it could mm -hmm. be anywhere. And then then you go into where the the archives are, and although it's been renovated recently, when I first went there, it, um, the archives spilled over from room to room to room, probably about 20 rooms. And all of the material is on you know, beautiful, polished wooden shelves. And it's wrapped in vellum or in leather. And it always seems to be golden light coming in through leaded panes of glass. I mean, it's really pleasant mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> uh, uh, but the material that that is there, I mean, it's it's the minutes of the um, index of um, the Forbidden Books mm -hmm. Committee. It's the it's the minutes of the group that actually ran the Inquisition, the group mm -hmm. of of cardinals. There are some trials. There are um, um, there are you know arguments for the um, you know pro and con for the you know, the condemnation of this person or or that person. You know Descartes. For, for instance. Um, and on the walls, in some areas that are restricted, you can see the names of contemporary theologians, you know, in, in kind of library boxes with names like, um, you know, like Leonardo Boff, uh, for instance, um, scrawled on the spine. And of course, what you really want to do is have all people of authority leave, and then you can take yeah. them down. Um, so the uh, it, in many ways, it's just it's like any wonderful old library. Um, the system under which it's arranged is kind of strange because it's it's arranged according to the more like the, the mental map of the Vatican rather than a 21st century mm -hmm. library cataloging system. So mortal sins. It's almost like sins. that. Yeah. Doubts. <laughs> right. Apparitions. I mean. There's, it's it's more like Hogwarts than you want to think. <laughs> I should we should we should let other people um, have a chance. Sure. Do you any questions you would like to ask, Colin? I mean, I'm happy to keep, keep going, but there. And I think there's a microphone. Here yes. That Thank you. Good evening. I was surprised to hear you say that only two percent of the people actually prosecuted had been burned at the stake. My naive image of the Inquisition was that everyone was burned at the stake. So what happened to the other 98%? <coughs> well, 
Um, good question. And my, my, um, my, my thought before I began looking into this was the same as yours. Um, the, the actuality is, is that the numbers of people who came before the Inquisition were actually, was, was actually quite vast. And not all of the infractions were, you know, even according to the Inquisition, were all that serious. And so many people were sentenced, for instance, uh, to wear a certain kind of gown, a white gown with a yellow cross on it, you know, for a year or two years or five years. Um, occasionally people would have to spend a little bit of time in prison, but they didn't really have too many prisons then. Sometimes property would be confiscated. There was a whole range of things um, that, that could be done. Um, the, the, the 2% has been estimated by a couple of modern his, uh, Inquisition historians who are not apologists by any means, and it's important to understand that that 2%, we're still talking about tens of thousands of people. That means it, when you think about the number of people who were touched by Inquis Inquisition punishments of all kinds, you're up in the many hundreds of thousands. And, uh, uh, and, and I think the important thing to remember is um, that's, a, that's actually a very significant portion of a population in Europe at that time. You know, you're, not, you're, you're, you're not dealing with um, many hundreds of millions of people. Um, it's a much smaller population, and if you have you know, 500,000, 700,000 people who have somehow been touched by an in Inquisition tribunal, that gets you very close to everybody on the continent knowing somebody who was dealt with harshly by the Inquisition in some fashion. I, and I think that adds up to a very, um, uh, a very strong psychological imprint. Hi, I, I, I was really uh, taken by uh, with Guy and in his research. I was wondering, uh, with your uh, experience, what you think um, triggered him for this. What, was it his pride in his work, or was it dictated, or how, how did that start? Um, you know, that's a great question. I wish I wish there was a better way to answer it. But the getting into the interior life of um, of people in the Middle Ages is often very difficult. Uh, people are not writing, I mean, nowadays every other person is, is working on a memoir, <laughs> and, um, and virtually no one was working on a memoir back then. There is a, there is a scholar at Bard <coughs> College in the United States who has just published a book on the inner lives of the medieval inquisitors in which she's trying to go from the documents uh, and what we have of their work in their own in their own hand or that we can tell comes from their mind and trying to work backwards to figure out so what was making these people tick and she includes Bernard Guy in that and she includes Nicholas uh, Americk and it's somewhat unsatisfactory but but a really valiant effort. Um, Bernard Guy, the one thing we know about him um, is that he was he was meticulous he cared about his work According to his own lights, he probably was interested in saving souls in the only way he knew. Um, he goes, I mean, he's so interested in Inquisition work that he goes and visits when other Inquisitors are doing interrogations in other places. You mean picking up tips? Yeah, yeah or just being an observer, the mm -hmm. way a lawyer would go and watch, <laughs> watch someone. So for instance, in that, I mentioned the town of Matayu where 200 villagers were, were rounded up and then interrogated for two years. Bernard Guy goes to watch all of that, and so we, we know he's there. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of what kind of, of person he is. Yes, sir. Thank you for your <coughs> wonderful speech. Um, I was uh, thinking about the, the index of the, uh, of the books. To what extent, if you could find out that, has the uh, uh, the, the, the putting on the index of a book had an adverse effect in creating more interest and creating a counter movement. Right. Yeah, I've been hoping that they would revive the index and condemn my book. But, 
but they haven't done that. You know, that's, um, that's a terrific question because it, it works both ways. It depends, on, it depends on where you're talking about. Sometimes uh, you put a book on the, on, the, um, on, on the index of forbidden books and it actually has a dampening effect. People look, they see it's on the list, the local priest, the bishop, the magistrate, they, they say, no, nah, we don't want to take that risk. So you know, it suppresses uh, sales. But sometimes it has the opposite effect, especially outside the regions where the Inquisition has influence. So for instance, in the um, 16th, 17th century, you will actually see publishers noting in their advertising, you know, this is banned by the index of forbidden books. It's like, it's like banned in Boston. That's yeah, that's right. that's right. In um, the U.S., there is a thing that they would, when you wanted to show that your book was racy, it was banned in Boston, and this was exactly. this was good. This is help sales. I mean, so they literally would do that. It was a, it was a it was a marketing tool. <laughs> yeah. So you're exactly right. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that there was a time that triggered the Inquisition, that there were, there were factors. Um, th there, uh, was, there initi was there one initiator of, of that Inquisition? Uh, it depends, but I'll give you some examples. So in the south of France in the, in the early 13th century, there was a, there was a major upsurge of heresy, um, Cathars and some other groups, for a variety of reasons. And, but, it was a, but it represented a big challenge to the church, both because these people were, they were just having nothing to do with priests or ecclesiastical um, discipline or anything at all, and also because uh, powerful local people saw that they could ally themselves with the heretics and it would be good for them in various ways. So it was a very complicated process, but it was, a, it was also a very serious threat. And the church had tried many different ways to deal with this. Nothing seemed to work. And finally, they came up with this idea of the Inquisition, which actually did work. So that's, that's one example. But the Spanish Inquisition is a is a different matter altogether. You know, they weren't, the, Ferdinand and, and Isabella were not really concerned with heretics like Cathars. Um, they had a lot of things on their mind. Um, Spain was deeply anti-Semitic. Um, many, you know, some people were charging that conversos were keeping their Judaic faith. The, the king and the queen were concerned about unifying a kingdom that, um, you know, for in many ways, could easily have fallen apart. They had just unified it. Um, many things came together, and um, you know, and even now historians can't say exactly what the key precipitating factor do was. You, do you have an inquisition without Torquemada? Because he was this you know, charismatic figure in the right place. I think you would. I think you would have. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, I mean, he was he was a ex exceedingly important person. Mm -hmm. He was a great organizer and he was a zealot and he really um, uh, he really whipped this thing into, into shape. Um, but Isabella in particular was, um, was also uh, a zealot mm -hmm. and, and you know, the king and queen didn't need a whole lot of persuading here. And, and when the, the Pope himself tried to intervene in the early days of the Spanish Inquisition, because he saw it getting out of hand, he it was, you know, it was worse than even the Pope would have allowed, <laughs> and um, and and he tried to lay down rules and regulations, um, and say do it this way, not that way, and and it was the King and the Queen who stepped in and basically said, um, you know, this is under our control, um, you know, don't tell us what to do. I think there was was there one other question here? Yes, sir. In your, in your speech, uh, I actually have two questions. In your speech, you drew parallels with the past and the present day. And of course, one thing that worries, I think, a lot of citizens is how this, you know, Guantanamo Bay, the war on terrorism, keeps on perpetuating itself. 
what kind of lessons could you draw from your study of the Inquisition to avoid things really getting out of hand of that, you know, Iran being bombed in a couple of weeks maybe? That's my first question. The second question is on a more personal level. You mentioned that, you know, you're being a Catholic, and I was wondering how the study of the Inquisition affected your view of uh, Catholicism. So thank you. Thank you. I'm just trying to think which of those I want to <laughs> end with. <laughs> Um, actually, I'll take the second one um, first. Um, well, I'm certainly not going to sit here and say that studying the Inquisition, Inquisition made me, um, you know, improved my <laughs> my view. Uh, the um, there are many institutions in this world that I think have great value that are also deeply flawed, and um, and so the church is is one of those. Um, uh, but I, I see uh, a great deal. I'm the sort of person who does not like to discard valuable institutions lightly because they're so hard to create um, and often provide a great deal of, of, of worthy, worthiness and, and meaning. And, um, and I think in general, people nowadays uh, too easily cast institutions aside um, when they contribute, in fact, something important. Um, furthermore, um, there have always been two traditions in the, in the church that are, have been kind of at war with one another. And um, one of them is this very rigid doctrinal, my way or the highway uh, approach. And the other, which I think is the, is the form that most Catholics nowadays subscribe to, is not like that. It is, um, it is very, very questioning. It uh, puts a high priority on doubt. Um, it's the kind of, um, I referred to Edward Skillebex earlier, the kind of work that, that he did epitomizes that. Um, and I'm on that side of, of, of things. Um, I think by studying the Inquisition, you, you learn one thing that is important, which is um, the uh, the utter necessity for any institution to be humble and to understand that there is no one true path and to believe otherwise is almost always a recipe for catastrophe. Um, so that's what I take away from in terms of Catholicism and, and myself. And then the question of what can we – what. To, to the extent that things are going on now that are very worrisome in terms of surveillance, information gathering, um, and, um, and other sorts of activities, which don't seem as if they are going to stop any time soon. Um, I alluded at, in, towards the end of my talk to the fact that I, I don't have a great deal of faith that there's going to be a technological solution to this. I'm not sure that laws can um, be put in place that are as strong as the forces that would overcome them. Um, to the extent that I have faith, I put faith in the power of ideas. I, 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 in many ways, the Inquisition was put to death by ideas. And, uh, and, th and, and this moment in history seems to me the, the perfect one for people of all kinds in thousands of different ways, whether by supporting libraries or um, work on the internet or whatever, um, to do what they can to advance the idea of tolerance. It's not an idea that I hear spoken about very much in the United States right now. Right now. I see the opposite. I see rights being mm -hmm. constricted. I see the courts putting limits on, on, on speech and um, so all that I would urge is, is for every person, to the extent that he or she can, to, um, to make the idea of, of tolerance uh, a byword, the way in which, say, equality has, has become. Um, that's, not a, you know, that's not a powerful answer, but it's the only one that I can really think of.
So I take it you're not uh, going to surveil yourself and, and put all your information on a Facebook account? I, I don't. And you're not going to help? <laughs> no, I don't have a Facebook account. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's yeah. really been a pleasure to be here with you this evening. I really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you both very much. Actually, I had uh, one question which I had uh, while I was reading the book, and it came up a couple of times while you were talking. You talk about... Um, the Inquisition developing these techniques of uh, torture and surveillance and so on, and you talk about the modern uh, manifestations of them. What about direct connective tissue? To what extent were people directly saying, that is a great idea, let's develop it and use it for our secular institution or whatever, or to what extent is it it was just in the air, or, or is, there, is there really direct connection? Sometimes you can see it. Sometimes you can see a direct connection. Most. Mostly it's not. Mostly it's because um, you know, modern tools are coming into existence. It's a feature of modernity. That, that's right. But I'll give you two, two examples. One of them is during, in England when um, Queen Elizabeth is, has kind of turned the tables and is persecuting Catholics. Um, and her, her chief um, um, minister writes in his diary that, you know, boy, the things that we are doing are just like the things that the Inquisition is doing, but you know, but worse. Mm. And so there's a case where you actually see someone making a literal connection. And another case is uh, much more recent, and that's when the uh, the Intelligence Science Board, which is a advisory board of the U.S. government, um, when it produced a a volume on um, intelligence interrogation techniques around 2005. And, and in the preface, they basically thank Nicholas Eimerich, uh as <laughs> as being one of the uh, you know the forebears. <laughs> they didn't quite so they didn't quite go so far as to say who made this book possible. But, <laughs> but they were pointing. They, they're, they, they're being honest anyway. They yeah. were pointing a finger directly at him. Yeah, yeah. Very good. All right, um, Charles. Thank you very much, and Colin as well. I'd, uh, while I've got you all seated, I just want to quickly thank uh, organizations that have made this. Uh, event possible. The Holland America Friendship Foundation, Walters Kluwer, Google. For some, somehow Google ends up appearing in every, in every talk, it just, uh, which is, I guess, not surprising. Uh, Hold, PricewaterhouseCoopers, DHR, McKinsey, and the U.S. Embassy. Uh, upcoming John Adams events. On March 6th, we've got Deborah Scroggins, whose book, Wanted Women, is about uh, two Muslim women in the West, one of whom, Ayan Hirsi Ali, had uh, a lot of experience here. Uh, that will be right uh, here, March 8th, March 8th, that is. Uh, April 2nd, we have just confirmed that Walter Isaacson will be here with the, his biography of Steve Jobs. Um, in, also in April, we have Jeannie Ritiker, who is the um, uh, director of a documentary called Peace Unveiled about uh, the role of women in Afghanistan. April 24th, we have the novelist Patrick DeWitt, who has a terrific novel called The Sisters Brothers. Uh, and a little later, we've got Martha Nussbaum and Gail Lemon. Thank you all very much. Uh, before you stand up, I'm going to uh, whisk Cullen out first, if you'll allow us, because he's going to sign books out there. And if he can get out there first, then uh, uh, pe he'll be ready for, for people. Uh, so he'll sign books out uh, in the lobby. Thank you very much. Thank you.